has kind of become a tradition around here for me to create lists of fighting game characters that share a particular trait. They might be from the same country, have similar gameplay mechanics, look a lot like each other, or whatever else I can think of. Many times the inspiration even comes from you guys, they keep giving me lots of great ideas in the comment section. Regardless of where the ideas come from though, it seems I'm never able to make everyone happy. There's always someone missing who you think should have made a cut, so this time I decided to truly embrace the concept of fan service and make a list featuring 5 fighting game characters who, for one reason or another, failed to appear before. The first one is Chai Lin from The King of Fighters, who could or maybe should have appeared in my Taekwondo Fighters video. Shoutouts to users Background Guy and I drew this pixel squirrel for pointing this one out. The reason behind Chai Lin's absence is that I completely forgot about her until I was halfway done with the video. By then it was too late to change everything, so I ended up dropping her and giving Mei Li Jingju a chance instead. When the video was released, I kinda knew already that requests for Chai Lin were coming and you guys didn't disappoint me. So who is Chai Lin? Appearing in the King of Fighters Maximum Impact, she's the second female Taekwondo fighter in the KOF franchise, but the first one to perform the art and wear a dobok, the traditional uniform worn by practitioners of Korean martial arts. Chai Lim's origin behind the scenes is quite interesting, as instead of her, King Cup One was originally set to appear in the Maximum Impact series under the name Mr. Taekwondo, kinda like the art of fighting franchise has Mr. Karate. When the designers decided to leave Kim out of the game, several other characters were considered for the spot, including many SNK veterans like Jun Hoon and Buriki One's So Young Song. But in the end, they opted to go with another female Taekwondo fighter with the same professional manner as Kim, which eventually formed the basis for Chai Lim. Her backstory tells us that she began learning Taekwondo at the age of 5 and is rumored to be Kim's secret weapon for the King of Fighters tournaments. To set her apart from other SNK Taekwondo fighters, Lim was made to be the struggling student who was not as adept as her peers or mentor, but possessed a dominating determination. Though she seems to inherit Kim's seriousness in battle, Lim reverts to being a normal girl when she takes off her gloves and enjoys being with her friends on her spare time, as well as designing her own clothes. The second Miss character comes from my Falk and Female Staff Fighters video, and it's Marvel vs. Capcom Sun Sun, as requested by users Brother Orin, Phoenix Omega and Roberto Garibay. The reason why Sun Sun was not featured in my list is because I often like to mix fan favorites with unknown characters, as I think this makes for a more entertaining video. So when my research pointed me to Karin Sun from Voltage Fighter Gaokaiser, who basically shares the same character concept with Sun Sun, I knew I had to pick one of them and I went with Karin. Not everyone agreed with that decision though, so as requested, here's Sun Sun's time in the spotlight. Originally from, and also so far only staring in Marvel vs. Capcom 2, she's actually the granddaughter of the main protagonist of Capcom's 1984 platform game Son Son, with whom she also shares her name. Both are based on the Monkey King, Sun Wukong, known as Son Goku in Japan, the main character of the Chinese novel Journey to the West. Son Son was taught by her grandfather and inherited his staff, though her powers in Marvel vs. Capcom 2 are more based on the book than the original arcade game. Her participation in the events of the game is due to the fact that when Abyss awoke from its slumber, the village where Son Son lives was suddenly afflicted by a strange disease, prompting her to venture outside in order to discover the source behind this unknown illness. As a fighter, Son Son is a strong rushdown character with a lot of reach on her attacks and the ability to perform most of her specials in mid-air. Unlike most speedsters, her health is at average at best, and she also has powerful combos and air combos slash aerial raves. However, her more underrated attacks can leave her open to punish, and she's not that spectacular in the bigger tournament scenes. You know what? I just noticed this list is turning out to be pretty heavy on female fighters, and there's even more ahead, so let's take a break from that. Here's a guy I missed in both my videos about big characters in fighting games, Juggernaut from X-Men Children of the Atom. This suggestion comes from a lot, and I mean a lot of viewers. Bear with me, cause here's a shout out to everybody. Tumor for KDX, Luis Felipe Silveira Souza, Shin Baxter, Maverick, Voodas, Mr. Macross, Angels2425, John Doe, Sparta Hannibal, Luigi777888, Simply Sam, and Istu Pemba. Why he wasn't featured before? Well, this time it's because I simply forgot about him. 
at least that was the reason the first time. For the sequel, I obviously had seen his name suggested in the comments, but I just decided to cover other people first and he ended up missing the cut again. Juggernaut, aka Ken Marco, has been around for a long time in the comics, first appearing in X-Men number 12 in July 1965. He's Charles Xavier's stepbrother, who would constantly bully him as a child and would later become one of the most memorable antagonists of the X-Men. Though some adaptations depict him as a mutant, Ken Marco obtained his powers through the Crimson Gen of Sitorak, a magical artifact he once found in a cave. As a juggernaut, he possesses almost infinite levels of strength and durability, but he is perhaps better known for being nearly unstoppable once he gets momentum. Juggernaut serves as the penultimate boss in X-Men Children of the Atom, right before Magneto. Though he's not normally selectable, there are codes that allow you to use him and, as you probably know, he later became a regular in the Versus series. His gameplay is simple, straightforward and one-dimensional. Juggernaut is made to deal damage. Tons of damage. He easily has the highest per hit damage output amongst the entire roster and also has an excellent ground game. His light normals have surprisingly good range and speed and his heavy bottoms deal massive damage, although they also come with a huge delay in recovery time. His super, the Juggernaut Head Crush, is also extremely effective. It has fast startup and movement speed once activated and can blow through similar attacks. In fact, the Juggernaut reminds me of Duke's line in Rocky Balboa when he's giving advice during the training montage. So what we'll be calling on is good old fashioned blunt Force trauma, horsepower, heavy duty, cast iron, pile driving punches that will have to hurt so much they'll rattle his ancestors. Every time you hit him with his shot, it's gotta feel like he tried kissing the express train. Yeah, let's start building some hurting bombs. As for his size, though the Capcom games lack an official measurement, unlike the comics where he's listed as being 287 centimeters tall. He is clearly a big fella, both in height and width. He's also highly disproportionate, with arms so big that they make even the hoax look smaller in comparison. Alright, so now we can go back to the girls, cause there's one more female fighter who has been heavily requested around these parts. Ibuki from Street Fighter, who missed both fighting game ninja lists. This suggestion comes from viewers Unnamed Entity, Another Bot, Ochonganoku, Armless Kirby, Kamen Rider 1 and Alex McNeil. Why wasn't Ibuki featured before, you ask? Well, in this case, I just felt like I had to cover other people first. It would eventually be her time to shine if the fighting game ninja list were to continue, but like a good ninja, Ibuki won't even have to wait for that, as she's sneaking her way into this list right here. Ibuki is a young girl from Japan, raised in a hidden village and trained in the deadly arts of ninjutsu. Unlike most other female ninja or kunoichi in video games or anime, Ibuki's outfit is a more traditional type of ninja dogi, consisting of a sleeveless upper garment, baggy pants, arm guards and a mask that conceals the lower half of her face. In Street Fighter V, however, she wears her school uniform and sneakers in battle, but also her mask, as well as dark brown arm and leg guards. While she is a trained assassin, Ibuki isn't particularly too fond of her lot in life and would rather live like a normal teenage girl if given the opportunity. Usually Ibuki's participation in the events of the story are either because of a mission given by her clan, like in Street Fighter 3 when she was sent after the GIF file, or simply because she chose to skip training to pursue something else, like in Pocket Fighter when she is searching for an ice cream shop, or Street Fighter 4 when she wants to meet a cool and handsome guy. Ibuki's fighting style is characterized by her speed and agility. Several of her special moves are useful in both closing distance and evading her foe or their attacks. While she may not be as strong as other characters, Ibuki hits fast and her deadly mix-ups allow her to rack up damage pretty fast when she gets going. These combos aren't always easy to perform though. Ibuki's speed and agility can also be rather confusing for the one who actually plays her and some of her special moves, if used at the wrong time, can put the player into situations where she becomes extremely vulnerable. To play effectively with her, it's best to have very good reflexes and a fair amount of dexterity. That is probably the reason why, even though I really like Ibuki as a character, I never got the hang of actually playing as her, so to me she is doomed to always be one of those characters I only see when I play against them. To be fair though, that is a lot better than never ever having played with a character which is precisely the case of her last fighter for this list, 
Eon Kalkos from Soul Calibur, who missed the chance to be in the Sodom and Fighters Who Changed Their Weapons video. This one comes from two viewers with clearly much more Soul Calibur experience than myself, Silver Slade and Bubba's85. I guess the reason for his absence in that video is pretty clear, right? I barely played Soul Calibur, like, at all. I know a few things about it just from watching and doing research. You might have noticed that I really enjoy learning about the lore behind fighting games, but my hands-on experience with the series is extremely limited, and on those brief sessions, neither myself or my friends ever picked this guy, so I straight up didn't know about him and his ever-changing weaponry. I've now done my research though, and he has more than earned his right to be featured here. Eon Kalkos, sometimes known as Lizardman, made his debut in the first Soul Calibur game, which, remember, is in itself a sequel to Soul Edge, aka Soul Blade. The next game in the series featured a generic Lizardman, and after that, in Soul Calibur 3, Eon returned to become a regular part of the cast. Like Sophithia, Eon Kalkos was one of the 24 warriors to receive an oracle from the god Hephaestus to destroy Soul Edge. Armed with a holy sheath sword and game shield, he set off on his journey. However, he became lost in a vast desert and was saved by a group of kind desert travelers who rescued a dehydrated Eon and brought him to their village. Before he could repay their kindness though, the evil seed rained down and temporarily changed Eon into a mindless killer, causing him to slaughter everyone there. Eventually, a guy named Kumpaitsku, the Grand Priest of a cult, heard stories of him and captured Kalkos so that he may be used as a human guinea pig in a diabolical experiment, causing him to transform into a lizard, the first of many lizard men to come. This marked the beginning of Eon's tragic story. Subsequent entries in the series would see him struggle with the gradual loss of his humanity, abandon the gods he believed had forsaken him, and eventually give in and truly become a monster, losing all his human feelings and memories. Before he knew it, other lizard men surrounded him and with his superior strength and battle technique, he dominated the group, soon becoming their leader and leading them on violent rampages. Over the course of the series, his weapon of choice have been changed multiple times. In Soul Calibur, he wielded a short sword and a shield. In Soul Calibur 3 and 4, a hand axe and a shield. And finally, dual hand axes in Soul Calibur 5. As for how he plays, well, I'm obviously no expert in the matter. As far as my research goes, though, his Soul Calibur 5 incarnation is a mixture of both a powerful and a very vulnerable fighter. Eom seems to be equipped with some devastating attacks, but at the same time, quite a few weaknesses that ultimately grant him a low position in tier list. While he may have great power and decent speed, he lacks range and attack rate, which can make him look cornered and helpless in front of opponents like Ivy, who is perhaps one of his worst matchups. So, well, that is it for this list, my dudes. I'm sorry for not mentioning these characters before, but here they are, finally enjoying a well-deserved time under the spotlight. A big thank you to everybody that was featured in this video, as well as everybody else that leaves their opinions and suggestions in the comment section. This interaction with you guys is awesome, and in many cases it's because of your ideas that I get to learn about and later share other cool things with everybody else. So really, thank you. If you enjoy the content I create, I suppose you already know what to do to help. Leave a like and a comment, subscribe if you haven't, and maybe share this video with a couple of friends. If you're feeling generous, you can even help support the channel through Patreon. The link is in the description. Another thing you can do if you're not yet tired of my voice is head to your favorite podcast app and search for my new real play RPG podcast called World Warrior. It takes place in the Street Fighter universe and we might even have a spot available at the table if you're interested in joining that project. Give it a try if it sounds like your thing, or maybe recommend it to someone else. I'll leave a link for it in the description as well. And what's next for the channel? Well, let's just say a recent review trailer has sparkled a few ideas in my head. I'll see you guys next time.